Along the Niagara frontier, his name is legendary. A member of the Onondaga, or Seneca Nation, he was known as Sego Iwatha. To most non-indigenous people, he was called Red Jacket. He was born in 1750 and lived most of his life in Seneca Territory in the Genesee River Valley of western New York. During the American Revolution, the Onondaga and the other members of the Haudenosaunee, or Six Nations, supported the British, who recognized Segoyawatha's ability and employed him as a messenger. They also supplied him with a scarlet coat, which gave him his English name. Following the British loss in the Revolutionary War, Segoyawatha came into greater prominence as a leader, using his considerable skills as an orator and his command of the English language to campaign on behalf of the Onondaga with the now new United States federal government. This was an experience that was not only challenging, but humiliating. Particularly abhorrent to Segeawatha was the government's decision to force the Senecas onto reservations while their traditional lands came under the ownership of the government. As one historian has noted, Red Jacket connected the days of utter freedom with the days when all of his people's freedoms had vanished, days when there was no hope left for life in the traditions of their fathers. Following the American Revolution, some Onondaga and many Kayanha Kaheha or Mohawks moved to lands on both sides of the Grand River in what is now Southern Ontario. These lands had been given to them in return for their support during the Revolution. Red Jacket, however, and many Seneca remained in New York State. Then came the War of 1812. Again, drawing on his prestige and his eloquence, Sergei Iwatha persuaded the Haudenosaunee living in New York State to support the United States. At the same time, those living along the Grand River in Canada pledged to fight on behalf of the British. Red Jacket, although now in his 60s, took part in some of the battles of that war, including the Battle of Chippewa. Let's set the scene. During the early morning hours of July 3rd, 1814, a vast American invasion force under the command of Major General Jacob Brown crossed the Niagara River from the Buffalo area to the Canadian side. Fort Erie soon surrendered. The following day, the Americans marched north along the Niagara River making camp that night on the south side of what is now Usher's Creek, close to its mouth with the Niagara. The British forces, commanded by Major General Phineas Ryle, moved into position at Chippewa on the north side of Chippewa Creek. A strip of woods hit each camp's activities from the other's view. Beginning around dawn on July 5th, British snipers, using a densely wooded area for cover, began harassing pickets guarding the American camp. Eventually, Major General Brown became very annoyed at this harassment and ordered Brigadier General Peter Porter to take his force of volunteers and indigenous warriors, Red Jacket was one of them, and drive the enemy out of the woods and back across Chippewa Creek. Entering the woods, Porter's men soon encountered opposition from a force of British light infantry, militia, and indigenous warriors. The fight was vicious, later described by Porter as producing, quote, scenes of indescribable horror, unquote. It was a violent seesaw battle with both sides using, as one historian has put it, muskets, rifles, tomahawks, and scalping knives. Eventually, the Americans and their supporters were forced back. This action resulted and a number of deaths, including a total of 25 indigenous warriors, nine who were supporting the Americans and 16 who were fighting with the British. It has been a grisly prelude to phase two of the Battle of Chippewa that was fought by the regulars from both sides in a large open area referred to as a plain that was and still is immediately north of Usher's Creek and alongside the Niagara River. The result of this contest was a British withdrawal from the field. Red Jacket has survived the Battle of Chippewa 
but was deeply saddened at the loss of so many indigenous warriors. He was equally distressed at the realization that these warriors were fighting brother against brother in what was a white man's war. He returned to his home, which by now was on the Buffalo Creek Reservation, and took no further part in the conflict. Following the war, he became increasingly concerned about the growing white influence among his people and tried his best to resist it. In one of his stirring speeches, he vigorously stated, we stand a small island in the bosom of the great waters. We are encircled, we are encompassed, the evil spirit rides the blast, the waters are disturbed, they rise. They press upon us and the waves settle over us. We disappear forever. Who then lives to mourn us? None. What marks our extermination? Nothing, nothing. Red Jacket became especially infuriated with a white missionary who was trying to Christianize the Senecas. Sergei Yawatha's oratory came to the forefront once again. Brother, you say there is but one way to worship and serve the great spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not agree? We also have a religion which was given to our forefathers and has been handed down to their children. It teaches us to be thankful for the favors we receive, to love each other, to be united. We never quarrel about religion. You have got our country, but are not satisfied. You want to force your religion upon us. We are told that you have been preaching to the white people of this place. We will wait a little and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If it does them good and makes them honest and less disposed to cheat Indians, we will then consider again what you have said. In early January 1830, Sergei Yawatha realized his life span was about to end. To those around him, he stated, be sure that my grave be not made by a white man. Let them not pursue me there. Today, Sego Yawatha, Red Jacket, lies at rest in Buffalo's Forest Lawn Cemetery in a grave prepared by white men.